Yeah, uh, that's the region or the, the territory, if you will, of Turkey where um, St. Nicholas was, was born. And it's going to be hard for you all to see on the bottom, but he was from a place called Patara, um, which is down kind of the bottom left. Um, maybe if you can see Xanthos, if you can see that. Um, it's kind of like Padalio, which is in the middle. I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of these right, but uh, if you go down this way from it and hit the coastline, Patara is down there in the bottom. Uh, but that's where he was uh, born and, and where he grew up. Um, it was roughly 280. I did some research and really, uh, there's not a whole lot of information on, on Nicholas as far as uh, verified historical um, data about who he was. There's a lot of ideas and there's a lot of, you know, um, legends and different stories about him, but as far as, you know, finding documents and references to him, there's not a whole lot. So there's not a, a lot of things that we can really know definitively about his life and his death and all of that. So 280 roughly is about when he was believed to be a born. I saw one that was 270 uh, potentially, so around in that area. And uh, then he is suppo supposed to have died on December 6th, uh, 343 AD, which December 6th is actually St. Nicholas Feast Day. Um, in the Catholic Church and the, and the Eastern Church. So this past Sunday was actually St. Nicholas Day. So something kind of fun fact for y'all, and it's interesting doing this, so that it's the same week um, that we're actually going to be talking about this. So you know, just something, a little factoid for y'all to take away. Um, he was actually uh, eventually uh, born, you know, became an orphan, that he started out in a wealthy family. To, you know, his parents were very well off, uh, but they died when he was still young, and so he became an orphan. Um, and the story of what happened is that ultimately, being in that Christian uh, background and everything, uh, he ended up following in, you know, the path of so many people in the New Testament church that we read about, you know, that they were giving up their possessions and um, helping the poor. Uh, we use, we may be referencing this tonight, but the story where Jesus tells uh, this one rich young ruler to sell all he has and give to the poor, and then he will um, be living and, you know, following Christ, and obviously he, he can't bring himself to do that. But that's basically what Nicholas does, is he sells all of the wealth that he has inherited so that he can help uh, the destitute in the city, he uh, helps the children, um, does a lot of ministry, and eventually he is actually elected to the Bishop of Mira. So Mira is that area um, around where he was born. So he becomes a bishop there and serves for a long time. He actually endured persecution under Emperor Diocletian, who was known for um, a lot of persecution of Christians. So um, Nicholas became exiled at some point in prison, things like that. He was eventually released and returned to being a bishop. Uh, I actually mentioned uh, Nicholas earlier in our series on uh, Jesus, I think, uh, a few weeks ago. And Nicholas is rumored uh, to have gone to the uh, Council of Nicaea where they were talking about whether Jesus was uh, you know, divine as God is or if he was just a man. Uh, and so they were working through this theological debate throughout the Roman Empire. And so they met at the council and Nicholas is rumored to have been there and actually, you know, slapped or punched uh, Arius in the face for claiming that Jesus was, you know, not divine in the same way that God is. Uh, that's actually, even though some of the websites I looked up and even on Wikipedia, I think, good old Wikipedia, um, presents it as though it is, you know, something that really happened. But there's a lot of documentation of the Council of Nicaea and there's no real uh, references to that happening or to Nicholas even being there. So it likely didn't happen and it's something that just kind of developed over time, but it's pretty pretty interesting to think about uh, when we think about, you know, the man who ultimately inspired Santa Claus, which is kind of funny. Um, so again, as we look into the things that Nicholas did, uh, after he dies, um, you know, all of these kind of stories and, and um, traditions start building up in honor of him. You have the, you know, the Catholic churches, uh, obviously known for the saints that they have, you know, so many of them that, you know, represent certain uh, different, you know, patron saints of certain groups of people. And Nicholas ultimately becomes, you know, the patron saint, patron saint of children, uh, patron, patron saint of uh, sailors and different people, because you'll notice where he's from was a coast town, coastal town. Uh, and so he did a lot of his ministry to people who were coming through merchants and those who were um, coming through on ships and things like that. So he's known for his love for children. Um, that's one of the things that stood out, that he was really good with children. I love uh, being able to minister to them and be able to uh, you know, give them gifts and things like that. So that's kind of, once you look at these, you start seeing where uh, some of our ideas about Santa Claus come from. 
Um, he's also known for his generosity to the poor. Again, he sold all that he had so that he could uh, be able to give to those who had need. Uh, he's associated, again, with ministry to sailors, uh, and then he becomes a saint eventually. And there's actually a development fairly early on about him that legends, it doesn't take long for his legend to spread and for different ideas and stories to kind of pop up across the Roman Empire about him. Even by uh, the 500s, the 6th century, you already have uh, Christian emperors at that point who are starting to mandate that churches be built um, in memory of St. Nicholas. And actually when I was reading some of the quotes and some of the comments and, and ideas that were popping up from the Roman Empire, you know, the Catholic Church, um, which those were, you know, more or less synonymous at the time. Um, what you see happen and developing is that they're they're already starting to talk about Nicholas in a way that's a little disconcerting coming from, you know, at least a Baptist background like I do. Uh, and most of, you know, a lot of us do. I know some people come from Catholic backgrounds, especially in here, so it may not be that um, shocking to some people. But some of the comments are already being made about him that kind of stuck, struck me was, uh, this idea that they were building churches in memory of St. Nicholas. And when, as I think about, you know, the idea that the church is supposed to be for Jesus. Um, and so you think of this idea that they're starting to commemorate him and, and take what is supposed to represent the kingdom of God and make it a representation of a, a man that, you know, lived a couple hundred years uh, prior to the, the time of the church. That's a little concerning for me as I read that and thinking, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot missing there, I think. Um, but that goes into showing just how, how quickly, you know, within 150 years of uh, <coughs> Nicholas's death, he's already got the Roman Empire, the, the uh, you know, people that are ruling the empire are mandating having churches built in his name. So obviously what he was doing, the way he lived his life, was having a profound impact. And as his legend spreads, it, eventually the Roman Empire you know, works its way into, further into the uh, Germanic tribe areas, you know, where we think of Germany and France. You have some people that are more from barbaric backgrounds, as we would think of, um, people who were not a part of the Roman Empire originally. And as the Catholic Church is spreading and they're sending missionaries and people uh, to those areas, uh, you start having this intermingling of uh, pagan religion with the Catholic practice. And so what happens is people, saints like Nicholas, end up kind of being um, adapted to the pagan peoples um, in a way that they start taking on thing, you know, mythology. Uh, the, th the stories that about that are about them are no longer just about that person. They're also stories that are about pagan deities, and they kind of just throw them all together into one character um, that becomes a, more of a legend than an actual person. Uh, so one of these uh, with the Germanic tribes, he started that I read that uh, you know some of the ideas about Saint Nicholas became uh, twisted with you know the god Odin, and if any of y'all have heard of him, and so. Uh, you have this idea where, where Nicholas, who was once a man, is now this legendary figure who does some of the things that Odin does, um, does you know all of these miraculous, uh, supernatural things, and uh, the idea of what Saint Nicholas stood for is already at this point getting really muddled and kind of shifting away from what he was he was about. So uh, a lot of the miracles that he's attested to doing for anyone you know I know we have again some people who are familiar with the Catholic uh, structure. But saints were only become saints if they performed, you know, a certain number of miracles, things like that. So there were a lot of miracles that were attested to uh, Nicholas while he was uh, here on earth and, and doing his ministry. And what I noticed that was interesting is he's actually credited with miracles that happened after he died. Um, not that that was an oversight in time. They actually believe that after he died, he was you know, still performing miracles. And we're going to go into a couple of these here that really stuck out to me. Um, one that this is going to really give us an idea of where the idea of stockings, uh, putting gifts in stockings and things came from, um, is that Nicholas is rumored to have uh, given dowries, you know, bags of gold, to poor daughters uh, for this one household. For example, this, this man had three daughters uh, and he didn't have much money. And, and back in that time, a woman's marriage ability, if you will, um, was really tied to the dowry that she had, how much money she could bring to the union. And so a man who's poor and has three daughters doesn't really have any way to, to provide a, a sizable dowry for them. And so the chances are they're going to be widows, there, or not widows, um, you know, be, be old maids, yeah, thank you. They're going to be old maids and they don't have any way of having any sort of, um, you know, husband to take care of them and, and help them out there. So what happens is that St. Nicholas is supposed to have snuck by. Uh, at some point, you know, at the night or whenever people weren't around and he tosses bags of gold in 
around the time that each of those uh, daughters is, needs to be married. And so what happens is they are able to get married because now they have a dowry to go with it. And supposedly his aim was so great that he uh, tossed, he lobbed the bags of gold into stockings that were hanging you know, in the house. And so that's kind of the idea of where hanging up stockings comes from um, and leaving gifts in them. So um, it's really interesting to, to read those historical things or at least the stories about them. Again, there's not really a lot of ways to verify that and, and know if it's really 100% true. And there's obviously some parts of the stories that, that came up about him that are clearly not true because you have the same story being told with like 10 different variations of really critical details. Uh, so that's pretty clear that some of this becomes legend instead of you know real historical uh, fact. Another example um, that he talks about, or he has talked about doing, is uh, that there were three children, you know, young children, who were playing um, out till late at night, and they were captured by a butcher, I guess, and killed and put into some sort of bath uh, to hide their remains or something. It's really dark. Uh, and then, but what happens is that Nicholas shows up and he like resurrects them. And so that's one of the things that he's known for and it kind of goes along with his, you know, being associated with children, a patron saint of children. Uh, and then you have other variations of that, that, you know, there's one where he supposedly after his death uh, returned a child who was taken by a Turkish emir, um, that he was abducted and used as a cupbearer for that emir, that leader. And then after his death, uh, St. Nicholas like somehow teleports the kid back to his mom's home uh, on his feast day, December 6th. So there's all kinds of really wild stories. A lot of those have different variations based on where they come from. Uh, but the idea obviously is that St. Nicholas becomes this very re renowned and, and venerated uh, character. But at this point, even a few hundred years after he's died, he's already really larger than life and the stories that are popping up about him are, you know, very difficult to imagine being real, Even, although they likely do you know, have some sort of basis in reality. Um, so at that point, you're already getting some of these issues, but then as we get further into history, getting to the Reformation era, era uh, in the, you know, Middle Ages, and those, that period, you're going to have even more stuff start working its way in. Have a nice uh, skip. All right, so um, this picture here on the left is really interesting. This is going to go with the last bullet, and this is kind of how Santa Claus made his way over to uh, America and, and how the how we think of Santa Claus today is really where uh, these last developments came from, and this starts in the 1860s, kind of around the Civil War period. And uh, his legacy in the, in the Reformation era, era starts to drop. It kind of diminishes because you have the reformers come in who are Protestant, uh, and they're trying to break away from a lot of the Catholic traditions. And so this idea of sainthood uh, seems you know, Im improper and unbiblical to the reformers, and so they get rid of the saints uh, as a part of practice and religion. Uh, and as a result, the popularity of St. Nicholas and any other saint starts to dwindle uh, as, as far as those historical uh, records go. And then uh, what happens, though, is that the Dutch keep that tradition and they, they kind of carry it on. And this is where Santa Claus, the, the name comes from um, because their term for him was Santa Claus. Um, and so you can see the, the connection as we pronounce it, that we would kind of work its way into Santa Claus. Um, and so they, they carry on this tradition despite the rest of Europe, you know, getting rid of it for the most part, at least in the Reformation uh, side of things. And then in the mid 19th century, 1863 is when this was published uh, to the left. This is the first Santa Claus cartoon that was developed over here and if you look in the picture Santa Claus is on the right uh, sitting on that little wagon I guess is what it is with the supplies on it and those are Union soldiers who are standing there and so he's depicted as giving out gifts to the Union soldiers uh, during the war uh, you know, obviously presumably at Christmas uh, and so this is kind of where we get the idea at first of Santa Claus coming um, onto the scene as far as what we think of him having this red suit and everything. Although at this point, he doesn't have the red suit. That develops even later uh, in the late 19th century, you know, a couple decades later, you start getting kind of more common depiction of him. So as we look at that, what I wanted to really address is what is the difference between Santa Claus and St. Nicholas? You know, is it, does it really matter 
you know, the legend that's, that has developed and the actual person, what are some of the things that we can take away from that example? And should it matter for us in celebrating Christmas, you know, for Christians, is it, should we continue to use Santa Claus? Should we maybe uh, get rid of Santa Claus? Is there some, you know, way in between that we can address the issue um, while not really completely removing Santa Claus from the picture? Uh, and so that's what we're gonna look at here. But as I was looking at the traditions that have developed around Santa Claus for us, they're really a lot of what Santa Claus reinforces and our culture has come to reinforce for a lot of people are Western values, not so much. Um, you know, we still have, Santa Claus is still associated with positive ideas and, um, you know, joy and uh, even generosity and things like that. But ultimately, I think underneath as we think about Santa Claus, there are some Western ideas that are going on there that kind of have forged a different perspective on Santa Claus than maybe what he than what he developed from being Saint Nicholas, uh, the real person. So as we're looking at this, the first one I saw from Santa Claus uh, is that ultimately there's a self-interest in that because our focus becomes, you know, what am I going to get from Santa Claus? What is he going to bring me at Christmas um, so that I can be happy? Then you have you know fixation on material possessions because he's associated with bringing you know actual gifts and toys and things like that. Uh, focus on receiving again. Uh, focus on moralism and this you can kind of see with the idea of if you're good then you'll get gifts if you're bad you're going to get cold and so you have this tradition of you know the idea you do good things and you're going to get rewarded for it uh, through material possessions and so this this fixation on material things like that kind of associates with with that tradition again it detracts from christ just from the fact that you know once you're focusing on santa claus that the more you focus on that there's a little less time uh, to devote to talking about Jesus. Uh, and lowers Jesus to just an all, another holiday symbol. And we're gonna get into this, but if Santa, if we elevate Santa and use him as a Christmas symbol, and you have him in, you know, in your household, the same popularity as Jesus does, then Jesus and Santa Claus are kind of just like holiday symbols that we use. And they kind of have an equality in there that we're just using them in the same way potentially. And there can be some, some issues with that. And then you have, the fact that Santa Claus is a fictional character, um, kind of a caricature, an, an idea. He kind of personifies an idea for us. Uh, and what I want to look at uh, is a couple of passages in Scripture that I think address some of these ideas and why, obviously, coming from a Christian perspective, those can be problematic for us. Uh, does anybody have, can anybody get uh, Mark 10, verses 21 through 23? loved him one thing you lack to sell go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven then come follow me this is the man's face at this the man's face fell he went away sad because he had great wealth jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of god all right and if we can get someone to start looking up luke 12 13 through 15 as well someone Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man who man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in cons yeah, does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Alright, so in both of those obviously Jesus is not talking about Santa Claus. He's not talking about any of the things we're discussing, but the principle carries over um, if we think about the idea of Santa Claus being someone who's just going to bring us gifts and, and uh, material possessions and stuff, especially, you know, if we just do the right things, we just, if we're just good, you know, Santa's going to reward us with things like that. So the, the principle is there, and, and that's some of these reasons, I think, this focus on the material possessions, amassing more things, um, is something that can be problematic if we're going to prop up Santa Claus um, in the traditional way that we have come to do. Uh, if we look at St. Nicholas, though, on the other hand, and we look at his life and what he really did, there are some other lessons that we can take away from that that are really polar opposite of what um, his legend has developed into. First, you're going to have self-sacrifice, you know, that he's giving up of his, himself, um, that he is an orphan, and, but instead of amassing that wealth, he's, getting, he's selling it so that he can do um, acts of service for other people. And then you have a renouncement of material possessions, again, with the selling of his wealth, um, his focus on giving, um, his focus on love, you know, loving people as opposed to just, you know, do's and don'ts about being naughty or nice. It's just, it's about showing love and not so much caught up on, you know, keeping a set of rules. 
Um, then you have the idea that he points to Christ because the reason why he is he did what he did by selling his, his things and ministering to people is because he was um, a disciple of Christ. And so he didn't just do it because he wanted to. He's doing it because of his faith in God and, and what um, his beliefs <laughs> led him to do. Then you have uh, the idea that he elevates Jesus um, to the life-changing Savior. So instead of Jesus just being another holiday symbol, perhaps, um, Jesus now is a life-changing Savior because we see what he did in, in Nicholas's life. And then we can see how that was used uh, by God to impact the lives of all the people that Nicholas was reaching out to. Uh, also, we see that he's a real disciple of Christ. So instead of